Kalen DeBoer made a curious return to the Seattle media space. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into a special Tuesday night edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor with Athlon Sports is inside the Huskies. I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like you want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day also. Summer long is at fanduel.com to get started. Lars, we got a super fun show for the everydayers today. We're going to be talking a little bit about Rashid Williams, who I think we both believe could be a nice breakout candidate at wide receiver this season. We're talking about Ladarian Clarity's crystal ball to Ole Miss. Probably feels too early, but the huge news of the day. Kalen DeBoer made his first return to the Seattle media space and did an interview on KJR Radio. Uh, after, over six months uh, after you know he departs for Alabama, that was that was something, Lars. Yeah, that's the best way to put it. I mean, you could have said Wordsmith joins KJR for a local tryout, and it would have been the same exact response because that was really all that Kalen DeBoer did was he. And it was one thing we texted. I texted you, you know, when we were listening to it. Is I'm like, he's so good at saying a whole lot without saying anything, and he really is. He, we knew it at Washington. But I think he's kind of refined that skill at Alabama where the fun, it was just so funny to hear him talking about recruiting and talking about this and that, this and that. And it's just like you're you're basically talking around everything you're wanting to say. Like there's, if there's a conveyor belt of words of like, here's what I would say. Here's the speech of what I'm saying. You are running parallel to that track without actually hopping on the track. Basically saying Alabama is the better job. Everybody knows that. No one's just disputing that. But the way in which you mentioned, he kind of took some subtle shots, you know, about the organ, you know, the structure, of the you know, the athletic department and things like that. And, you know, Softy asked sure. some great questions. You know, like you know, why why did you not sign the extension and this and that? And I think part of it is, as journalists, we know you're never going to get the full story on the record, and maybe even off the record, you're not going to get the full story. Yeah, absolutely. So when we when we were hearing some of those questions get asked, we're like, all right, you know what? He's doing the right thing by asking the questions, but there wasn't anything that Kalen was going to say that would make it better. And I think you made a great point that it made it worse more than anything else. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it certainly did in my opinion. And because the first question that I, I mean, you know, right after this happened was why do it now? You, you had six months to do it. There were, there were so many opportunities to save face, to say goodbye on social media, to do all these different things. Why do it now? I, I saw a really great theory on social media. You know, Caitlin's obviously going to have to be back up here at some point since his daughter's on the softball team. And it felt like that was the longest point of his conversation about Washington. And that was really disappointing and disheartening for me to hear personally, because Lars, as you and I know, Caitlin's legacy is always going to be really complicated. All, all the everydayers know this. All Husky fans know this, that his legacy is always going to be really, really complicated. But the things he said didn't make it better. Because, you know, like we're, we're not going to go down the road of when he actually heard from Alabama, when that those conversations were had, those rumors are out there. We know this. Troy Dannon was very blunt about it uh, in a, a, a donor's lunch after, you know, that all happened as well. Uh, but I, th- there was really no way of looking at this where the situation was made better by these remarks. Like the fact that it was, Oh, Alabama, this Alabama, this Alabama, that that was really disheartening where, you know, you could have, you, you could have just spent the entire time, the whole 20, 25 minute interview talking about the good days of Washington. And yeah, you know, uh, there, there was certainly the marks of, yeah, you know, it was great to, you know, those memories, this, that, which are, yeah, absolutely. You and I are going to cherish those memories for a very long time. They were wonderful. We know Husky fans will as well, but it makes it even harder to look back on it now and just say, yeah, like Kayla DeBoer was the architect of a lot of that because of, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to say disinterest in Washington because he certainly put in a lot of time and effort to build the program into what it was. That's not the word I want to use here at all, but just the way that it just kind of seemed so nonchalantly tossed to the side. 
in a way apathetic where he viewed it as hey this is going to get me to the next destination which is a great destination in alabama and softy asked him that you know why couldn't you do that at washington and well the resort this and that and this and that and i think it just was a whole lot of roundabout what about ism you know what about this what about that and he didn't say what about but just it was that kind of demeanor where there was nothing that he was going to say that was you know what? Yeah, I regret. You know, he didn't say flat out, I regret not putting out a statement thanking the fans for their last two years and this incredible road that we, you know, drive that we were on the past 48, you know, 24 months in Washington and, you know, the national championship and everything like that. He mentioned, like, oh, I can't wait to have the players go to the NFL so that I can talk to them again. Why would the players who didn't show up to your team meeting when you announced that you were leaving to Alabama want any part of you three or four years down the road after everything is settled? They might be grateful and they might say, you know, thank you for everything. This oh, and that. No, absolutely. But, but right, no, no. But we're, we're, one thing is because they they absolutely will be. They're, they're certainly like we, we can't discount that. We don't. But like we know that certain guys didn't want to go through a third or a fourth coaching change. That's respectable. We totally understand that. We're not faulting any of those, those upperclassmen, you know, the Mish Powell's, the Nate Kalepo's, Julius Pilos, the Asa Turner's of the world, Garen Hatchet being another one who were on their third or fourth coach that wanted to go somewhere else and try that again. That's that, that's one thing, but you know, like, yeah, all these guys who felt like he was going to be here for a while and the way he talked about it, like he wanted to be here for a while, it, it, that 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 made it tough. Yeah, well, and what, what, what was really tough, and we won't elaborate too much on this, but citing policy and following the rules yeah. of the Tybo Rogers situation. I, I we're just gonna thirty seconds here because I don't want to. We could spend almost the entire show on that whole deal, but I just think it was that that was an example of okay, you're basically making this appearance to pump up where you're at now. You're not going to talk about anything else that happened and the other people that were there that are also gone, you know, basically just saying, Hey, you know, all I'm going to say is I put out a statement and we followed the policy. I, that, so th- th- there could be a little more that you could add to it to say, Hey, you know what? It was an unfortunate situation. This and that, I don't want to go too deep into it. But again, it was that 30,000 view of, Hey, you know, I'm just going to kind of distance myself. From here. Yeah. Like that, that's one thing. And certainly we don't want to go down that road, but it just felt like there was so there, there were, there were way more questions than answers is the best takeaway that I could possibly give from this where I like, I, I look at every single question that I was asked and I'm, you know, I was sitting here listening on the iHeartRadio app and like, I was just like kind of screaming at my computer. Like, why, like, why, where is this? Where is this? Where is that? I, I, I don't think I heard the name Roma Dunes, eh? Like I like Michael Penix was, was certainly brought up, but I don't think I heard the name Roma Dutze who went ninth overall. Like I don't think I heard the name Troy Fautano who went twentieth overall. Like that, you know, he set he tied a program record with three first round picks. Hey, like Mike got a got a brief shout out, but that was it. Like it, it was insane. <laughs> It, it was a really weird, basically, hey, I had, it's almost like doing an internship for two years at a place where you were the MVP intern. You did, you know, everybody that was there that worked at the company say, hey, this guy did great. He did so many great things, but basically just like disappeared. And that was it. And I don't think necessarily, I think, I'm not saying Kalen was an intern the past couple of years, but I'm just saying the level of attachment doesn't necessarily seem to say, and we're not expecting that he would go out of the way to do it. But the other thing that I do want to, hit, you know, kind of touch on with this is, Kalen, a former UW employee, went on the flagship station and still really didn't care. And I think that is the other side of this coin where some, you know, if he goes on a, a network that maybe isn't attached to the university, I don't think anything would be different. I think it was like they this was the only friendly interview he could have potentially got. Like we would have answered, we would ask most of the same questions and absolutely, yeah. Potentially probably would potentially ask some more. Well. Right, exactly. And dove in a little bit more to some other areas as well. But it just really seemed like there, there seems to still be an underlying problem. And I don't know what it is, but there seems to, it almost seemed like, hey, we're going to come and meet and shake hands over the fence. But this fence still exists for a reason. These guys are not over here for a reason. We didn't hear Parker Brailsford. We didn't hear uh, Jeremy Bernard. We didn't hear Austin Mack. None of these players that Kalen brought, he could have done that. We're like, hey, you know, I know Parker was grateful for his time at Washington or this and that. It was, no, Alabama this, Alabama that, as you said. And it's just like, Honestly, could have gone without this interview. And that's no disrespect to Safi and KJR, but it's just the timing of it, what came to fruition. 
it just doesn't make any sense to me. Lars, you, you, you put it best. And the Ladarian, Ladarian Clarity situation is, is very curious as well. And we'll get there right after a message from our good friends over at FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games. The sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel is an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball and I'm going to keep doing it, especially, you know, right after we're recording this, Paul Skeens just had one of the best outings of his career. Uh, there's the unfortunate home run, Nolan Arenado, but he is just out of this world. Good NL Cy Young, NL Rookie of the Year, bet on Paul Skeens on FanDuel. Go check it out. Lars, Ladarian Clarity got a couple of crystal balls. I believe still Steve Wiltfong put one in as well for the four-star safety that Washington is recruiting from Scambia High School in Pensacola, Florida to choose Ole Miss. It seems like, you know, he's got, he's he released top five, but it seems like it's really down to three. It's Florida, or excuse me, Florida State, that's Ole Miss, and that's Washington. I think this is way too early for the, this crystal ball prediction because of one glaring event that's happening this weekend. I'm with you, but it's also why I said, and you're not wrong that it's the top three, but it's why I said it's the top two. It's Ole Miss and Washington. It really seems like sure. Florida State doesn't have that. And again, it's until he makes his decision, being a Florida kid, you're, a Florida State's always going to be there. Yeah, so I just think until Florida State is permanently eliminated when he does make his decision on August 3rd, sure. Florida State's always going to be there. But you do have Lane Kiffin, who's an immaculate recruiter, very personable, similar to Jed Fish in that way. Obviously, I think Jed's a little bit older, not too much older, but just a little bit older than Lane Kiffin. I could be wrong in that, but I'm, it's a safe assessment in that regard. And I really do think it, it's going to come down to these two schools. And if you think about it, what has Ole Miss been known for, especially this recruiting cycle? And not just the 25 class, but in 2024 with the transfer portal. They are really heavily investing in that football program down in Oxford. Yeah, That's not are. to say Washington isn't, but I could also see, hey, if I'm a four-star safety and old, you know, I remember I think Lane Kiffin was his Uber driver, air quotes Uber driver, when he was on his visit to Ole Miss, and he's like, hey, I'll take you anywhere you want as long as you come into the ship. And it's like, okay, there's something about that relationship and that kind of connection where I'm not surprised that this came with the early prediction. But I do think, to your point, it is a little early to say there's a definitive leader because, honestly, you can make the case for Washington and the fact that Clarity is coming up this weekend for the Luau, as you mentioned on the other show, or on yesterday's show, or, well, actually today's show, think, think, given when this is coming out. Um <laughs> That, you know, having that still in play as an unofficial visit, you're coming all the way across the country. If he was going to, let's say, Oxford and then to Washington, like, you know, 27th and then the 29th, and then he goes back home to Florida State and visits all three one more time for an unofficial, I would say, okay, equally open, maybe just checking off one more thing. This seems like he's going, it seems like Clarity is going out of his way to go back to Washington one more time. And there's just always been something about that relationship that he has with Vinny Sinceri that Vinny was one of the early guys that it, that offered him before Florida State, offered before most of the Florida school. And I think that matters to Clarity, where I don't remember in terms of the structure where Old Miss was. I think Washington offered slightly before Old Miss. I could be wrong in that regard. No, they offered but after I do Old think, Okay, and so that I think – and that's why I think Old Miss is always going to be there. I think, so that, that, that makes perfect sense. But it, I think going back into that Florida conversation, having that connection, I think that's why it's a really close one-to-two-horse one race between Old Miss and Washington for clarity. So you, you threw me a lob there with making the case for Washington, and, and, and I'm going to throw it down. I Everything you just said is, is completely correct. It's, it's on the nose. Let's take it a step further. Because one of the first things you pointed out is he is coming back up to Washington from Pensacola, Florida on an unofficial visit. Let me say that again, an unofficial visit where he has to pay his own way to get up here. And even the, the luau at, at, at the lake, like all these unofficial visits, you still have to pay some, you know, some fee. It's probably, you know, not anything significant, but you still have to pay some sort of fee to the coaching staff for that event that shows some kind of interest. And again, like I said, Florida, Washington for, you know, for anybody who's taken a bunch of cross country flights, like I have myself from living in LA to going to school in Boston, 
those, those take a while. They're, they're, they're quite taxing. So to do that a week before you commit says something, his relationship with, you know, the, the way he talks about not just Vinny Sinceri, but Steve Belichick, but Jed Fisher and this entire coaching staff says something. And, you know, our, our good friend on this show, Cameron Michelle, put out a fantastic article about all that over on Huskies Wire. Lars, one of his closest friends is Seattle Seahawks cornerback Devon Witherspoon. Like the, the two of them have, have a very long relationship that dates back to, you know, Witherspoon's time in high school. That should probably mean something here. Like, is it everything? Certainly not. But is it something that, you know, can't be ignored? Absolutely. For a top five pick, you know, at defensive back who's thriving in Seattle, which is a very long history of good defensive backs, like not, you know, not just in, in uh, on Mont Lake, but, you know, over at CenturyLink and, and you know, when, I'm not calling it Lumen Field. It's, it's still CenturyLink in our hearts. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that that's something that also counts and you, you put all these things together and it's it's really interesting because he seems like one of those guys where you know you look at the schools that he's interested in you look at the path that you know a lot of recruits always talk about trailblazing about wanting to make an, their own path wanting to just do something a little bit different than the guys before them you have aptly pointed this out many times he has two choices in front of him he can stay close to home which is, you know, great. Your family can come watch you do all these things. That's awesome. That's not a bad thing. As, you know, as we talk about on this show, in-state recruiting, very important. But he can also go across the country and start a whole new path at Washington. Because this, in my opinion, takes the whole Michael Penix conversation that we had with Brian Smith a couple weeks ago a whole step further. Where, you know, yeah, Mike is certainly going to make an impact on some of these, these Florida kids down the line, in my opinion. But... That's not something, you know, in, in, in the same ballpark here, in my opinion. And when you look at it, just the fact that this four-star blue chip recruit with 43 offers is considering Washington at this point in the process, that can significantly change things. If he comes in, he plays next year, he plays well, all of a sudden kids are going to see that. Kids in Florida are going to see that. The kids that they're recruiting in Alabama, in Mississippi, in North Carolina, just all over the South and all over the Midwest are going to see that and say, oh. Oh, it, it, things can actually be different at Washington under Jeff Fish. That means something, in my opinion. No, you're you're hundred. You said said a lot there, but nothing goes wrong. And I think you know, I, I remember mentioning that whole clarity with this room relationship on the on the podcast maybe yeah. a week or so ago. But I, and, I, and I think that was one of those where, again, Witherspoon goes to Illinois, so there's no school connection there. But having played in the Big Ten, you can say, hey, you know what? I can help. Not not you know in any monetary way, but just. As a fellow Pensacola kid, I can help you learn the ways in Seattle, get you acclimated, just kind of be a second voice, an older brother, if you will, a real older brother, if you will, in that regard. And I think that is undervalued. You're not undervalued, but that can't go unvalued. And then you mentioned this point to me off the record, or not off the record, technically off the record, before the show, when you said that likely there's going to be some other guys coming up. One of those guys who can pitch against going going to Florida State is a guy who picked against Florida State and they just made a sale. So the fact that he picked Washington over UCLA and Florida State, even though he made that official visit, he can say, hey, you know what? Come to the luau. I'll be up there with you. I'll explain Washington to you. And then you have Jonathan Epperson who could probably come over from Auburn Riverside and say, hey, you know what? I've lived yeah. in Alabama. I've lived in the South. I've lived in the East Coast. And even now I'm getting – I'm like two three years living in Seattle, even though he had a cup of coffee, no pun intended, earlier in his life in Seattle. Epperson is. Epperson, that is. Having those guys from different backgrounds choose Washington and relay that information to a guy coming up or an official thing, hey, you know what, let me just get around the guys in the class one more time and let me see if these guys can sell me. Because I think the relationship is already sold. And the one thing to consider with this, and this is no shot at Lane Kiffin or anything like that, but what has Ole Miss done in the past couple of years that lends me to think, hey, I can go there as a defensive player and be a you know day one, day two pick. Now, probably Clarity can go anywhere and end up being a day one, day two pick. When you look at what S, uh, Ole Miss has done in the SEC, they're good, but they're never sure. you know, ten to nine and three. They're in that nine and three, eight and four mold, so to speak. But it's not. Like it's they went firmly to the in a tier two category. 
Exactly. And Washington is still coming down from that arguably tier one category of playing a national championship. And so there's not the, oh, hey, well, it's Alabama versus Washington. No pun intended to the first segment. But there's a little bit of different draw. Or, or Georgia, that's a better example. Georgia and Washington. Let's say he's deciding between Georgia and Washington. Okay, hands up. That's, I understand if he goes to Georgia in that situation. Can't fault him. Plenty of evidence with guys going to the NFL from that program. Florida State and Ole Miss don't really have that same level of production. And then you think about the defensive backs that Washington in general has put in the NFL, Desmond Trufant, Mar- uh, Marcus Peters, Buda Baker at safety, the number got Taylor Rapp at safety. The list goes on and on. Withers- no, Withers- <laughs> Clarity can add his name to that list and say, hey, from the state of Florida, I also did it. You got a guy from Washington that did it. You got a guy from California that can do it. Why not let me plant that flag? And think about the guys that they've gotten in this class. Caleb Smith from Alabama, Tristan Kendrick Miller from Hawaii. They are not afraid to go and get these guys to start planting some flags. And I think that is a commendable effort for Jed Fish, whether they get him or not. But I think that's also why they're so close in this race for him in that respect. Lars, very, very well said. Pat on the back there for you. Now, let's let's get into some of the, the exciting young players on this roster. And one guy that you and I are both really high on is retro freshman wide receiver Rashid Williams. So first of all, I want to give a huge shout out to NCAA, excuse me, nope, I need to stop doing that, College Football 25, because it is College Football 25 now. I, you know, I'm doing my, my UW dynasty where, you know, we're killing it in year three and a whole bunch of top five classes, won the first two natties, uh, and enough about my, my video game life, nobody cares. Uh <laughs> But one thing that I thought was really fun in that, you know, in, in that same vein, because uh, I've, I've talked about this with, you know, with some friends who are also doing some UW dynasties, uh, are some of the younger players in the roster that EA is very high on. And EA has just chosen to, you know, let the game develop into stars. One of the best players on the roster is Rasheed Williams, which I thought was really cool. I really love that. And a big reason that I love that, and I, I know you do as well, is because he was really, really impressive during spring practice. Yeah, and it was one of the things that I know I know you did obviously like him, but there's some other guys that you liked in the room. But I just looked at Rashid the entire spring and was like, there's no reason this dude can't get it figured out this year. Now, again, it wasn't that he didn't have it figured out before last season. It was just, again, coming in from high school, three horsemen, a receiver, you're never going to see the field. No slight to you. But his frame – his size, his ball tracking, his hands. I think everything is there. He obviously can certainly get better as a route runner, and that's going to come with playing time. But I think that's why I was so high on him in the spring and when he was getting first team reps again. All things considered, Jeremiah Hunter was on the second team when Dems, when Rashid was on the first team. That's not to say that they couldn't both end up on the first team this fall, but there was just, you know, it's getting Rashid up to speed, getting Jer- help having Jeremiah help Demond Williams get up to speed in that regard. But I do think just the way that he was running this route, I remember talking to him at an NIL event and he's basically saying, dude, like, unless you fall off, like, there's no reason why you shouldn't have a breakout season. And I'm not saying that in the sense of have a thousand yards, you know, 12 touchdowns, sure. et cetera, et cetera. But just have that first layer season where you can set the bar for yourself. And I think physically he's there. He's going to get a little more weight in summer. I think that's probably yeah. without goes without saying. But if he's able to get into what, – what do you think he needs to be at, 185, 190-ish? I mean, 190, 190 yeah. But, but, you know, but but in that respect, um, just there's there's so much. And I think it's why when they didn't get Sakari Franklin goes to Illinois. Yeah, he went to Illinois. I don't think that was as big of a loss because Rashid is still there. You still have so many young weapons coming in. And I think Rashid is really going to surprise some people again. Was I, I don't was a was a four star prospect coming out of high school? I yeah, he was. He, you know, yeah. so, some people might have viewed him as a high three, but I think certainly would have played himself into four by some of those other sites. But regardless, I just think this is kind of that it's that first initial class that, yes, obviously um, Kevin Cummings has done great recruiting the class in twenty five, but developing these guys in twenty from twenty four and twenty three will be just as important to the progression on this offense. So I, I really like where you're going with that. I actually had a slightly different train of thought here where the way I thought about this was one of the things I was most impressed with, with him during spring practice was his ability to line up inside and out and in a, in a very different, but also similar way. I know that sounds really weird. He reminded me a lot of what we saw from Jeremy Bernard last season. 
And I thought that that might be the best role for him in 2024 where, you know, obviously after Jalen McMillan gets hurt and not that obviously not that we wish an injury on anyone, but after Jalen McMillan got hurt, Jeremy stepped up and played really well. And we saw his, his role increase. We saw his snaps and his targets increase, but I'm talking about when everybody was healthy, the Jeremy Bernard role. Where he's somebody who, you know, Jalen Polk needs a playoff. Jalen McMillan needs a playoff. It's okay. Oh, he can go line up in the slot. Oh, he can go line up in the X. Oh, he can go line up over here. He can go line up over there. That part of it is all great. I don't think he's going to, you know, obviously line up in the back backfield the way that Jeremy did, where that's where I think it's a little bit different. But everything else about what Jeremy did for this team in 2023, I firmly believe that Rashid can do in 2024. And Giles Jackson is going to be a really fun slot threat. I think that, you know, he his potential to really have set some career numbers in his final year of eligibility. And just the more that I look at Rashid from what we saw from during spring practice, his physicality at the catch point. And like, I, as you said, him adding weight, doing all those different things, his ability as a route runner has certainly tremendously improved since he got to, to UW. All those things just kind of lend credence to somebody who we're going to see him take that next step. And it's going to be called a breakout season. And then in 2025, you know, if Denzel Boston comes back, uh, assuming that he will, him and Rasheed Williams could form a really similar combination to what Denzel and Jeremiah can in 2024. I I think that it's just kind of, that's the natural progression for where he is right now and where he can be. And I just think that he's got the skill set needed to step into a much bigger role this season. No doubt. I think it, at the end of the day, Rasheed's going to be a guy where he'll, Barring injury, should play every single game this season. Now, how much and what, how does his role expand? I think it's almost perfectly suited for those first couple of weeks where you're playing lesser opponents, so you can get some of those. You're not going to get Jeremiah going for, you know, twelve for one forty and two touchdowns against Eastern Michigan. Well, I'm sure Jeremiah would love that, and I'm sure there's nothing wrong with that. I think those are the games which you want to get the younger players in the redshirt freshman and true freshman in just so they can kind of get their feet wet, knowing that you're going to have some of these veterans like a Jeremiah Hunter going through the entire season, knowing he's basically the veteran of the group. But to your point, I think Denzel, not Denzel, or she in that regard is that's why it's like, this is kind of the fundamental building block here where last year you get to learn how to be an athlete and learn how to be a college student and all those sort of things. Now this is basically your freshman season on the field because like we've discussed Shout out to Kalen DeBoer for the attention that he played to for uh, true freshman and redshirt freshman. But with that being said, that's the question that should have been asked. <laughs> that, that, that was a question that was missed. But Shout out to Devin Hyde for, for that wonderful backstory there, by the way. Never never forget Devin Hyde for that one. But no, w- with respect to Rashid, I think this was a guy we, you know, I talked to him when he was coming out as a recruit. And there, he came, you know, there's that COVID year where all those guys had, to, he was a guy that really seemed to get hardened in that COVID year. Not, not in terms of like emotionally or anything like that, but he really seemed to hone in on everything. And so I think giving him last year to kind of just in a similar way hone in and not have to worry about on the field progress, this is what's going to allow him. And again, He's got the perfect coach to do it. Again, we were also – I know Jer, uh, Jeremiah – Jamarcus Shepard was high on – was high was high on Rashid coming in last season, but knew there were some things that he needed to improve on. I think that's why bringing in a coach like Kevin Cummings with Jed from Arizona was so important because we saw what he could do with McMillan and Singer and all those guys at, at Arizona. Rashid, Denzel, all these guys have that perfect body type to just – all they need is time and targets. That's all they need. And guess what? This season, let it rip, Jed, because it's coming. Lars, very, very well said there as well. Now, before we get out of here, we're going to remind everybody about the Lockdown Huskies Insider Program, which is a really fun thing that, that we're so excited to announce and launch and get going. It is active now, so we really love for you to subscribe if you type go dogs in when you sign up the first hundred people will get 50% off for their first two months. It's four 99 a month after a two week free trial. And there are gonna be so many fun things on there. Obviously, you know, who, who wouldn't want to, you know, have some one-on-one time chat with us. Have, we'll answer all your questions, do whatever you want. We're going to be starting a Google sheets. We're going to do doing some film reviews. We're going to put some unfiltered coach and player interviews in there from, you know, our time at games, practices, press conferences. You're going to get our first thoughts, our very first thoughts before we hop on lockdown, 
Huskies. Before it goes up on our respective websites, our insiders are going to get first thoughts on everything that happens at every practice, every game, everything like that. It's all going to our insiders first. So you really want to make sure you sign up and you don't miss a single thing. We're going to have lots of other things like insider exclusive Q and A's that we're going to do here on YouTube. And the videos are only going to be going out to people that are our insiders. So you're going to make sure you want to sign up for that. The link is down in the episode description. It's going to be so much fun. We'd love to talk to you over there. We want to get to know all our everyday as we always love chatting with you. You know, when Lars runs into at the Mariners game or practice or wherever else, it's awesome. We truly love and appreciate it so much. And this is just another way we get to show our appreciation for you by bringing you so much extra fun content. It's going to be awesome. And Lars, with that being said, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all every day for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. we got so much more fun stuff coming for you. Just a reminder, this is going to take the place of our Wednesday episodes. We're going to be coming to you next on Thursday. And you know, the best way to be around when we drop bonus episodes like this is to subscribe wherever you get your podcast, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. We're updating the channel with new content every single day. Make sure you like, hit that like button, click that little bell so you never miss when we post a new video at a, you know, a different hour like this than we normally do. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you you know, we want to hear your thoughts about this Kalen DeBoer interview. You drop them right down below in the comment section. And if you're audio only, please leave us a five-star review. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you on Thursday.